Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the latest installment of the global webinar series from the International Sleep Charity. I'm Charlie Alton, one of the co-founders. And um, last time around, we had Brian Robertson, from, Dr. Brian Robertson from the United States talking about digital therapeutics. And that was really interesting about how he sees things developing. Um, we're overdue a visit to the world's most common sleep issue, insomnia. And what better person to talk about it than what is, in my opinion, uh, the top insomnia person in the UK, Professor Jason Ellis. I've known Jason for a number of years. Um, he's practiced insomnia research all his working life. Um, he also chairs the um, research committee for the British Sleep Society. And what I particularly like about him is he doesn't just do the theory, he also practices it himself. Now, um, he's chosen as his subject, Understanding Insomnia, which I think is a great title because it, it's often a psychological issue. So if you understand the problem, you're in a better position to uh, manage it. And for those of you who've got questions or want to uh, a bit more on certain topics, please send in your questions via the chat function or the Q&A bit that you'll find at the end. And um, we'll deal with those afterwards. So without any further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to the main man himself, Professor Jason Ellis, uh, Professor of Sleep at Northumbria University, the International Sleep Charity Floor is all yours, sir. Brilliant. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for the invitation and especially to the ISC for inviting me. So what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about insomnia, if I can find my desktop. Oh dear, right, let's see what we can do. Everyone can sit there reading all of my wonderful uh, background in the meantime. Right, so we're going to talk about understanding insomnia. We're gonna talk about what it is, how we define it and diagnose it. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more about how much of it actually exists in the general population and some of the consequences associated with insomnia. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about how we actually manage insomnia. And I love questions, so do feel free to send in your questions. Okay, so what is insomnia? And I always like to start with this particular definition by Gail Green. And she wrote a book called Insomniac. Now, the first thing I would say is I don't like the term insomniac. We don't call people with pain conditions paniacs, do we? But you know, we'll forgive her that. Now, Gail had insomnia for many, many years and she wrote a book about her experiences. And she says, I can't work, I can't think, I can't connect with anyone anymore. I mope through a day's work and haven't had a promotion in years. It's like I'm being sucked dry, eaten away, swallowed up, coming unglued. Now, why did I choose that definition? really on the basis of, let's look at all of the different areas that are affected by her insomnia. I can't work, occupational consequences. I can't think, cognitive consequences. I can't connect with anyone anymore, emotional consequences. I mope through a day's work, affect. What Gail's saying here is, irrespective of the insomnia itself, it's the impact it's having on her life and her day-to-day -day functioning. So what is this phenomenon? What is actually insomnia? Why do we need to bother? One of the problems that we have is that in many instances, we use the term insomnia quite a lot. You know, If I have a bad night, I'll come down the stairs and tell the cat, because I'm single, but I'll, I'll say to the cat, I've got insomnia, or I had insomnia. Really? One night? This is the reason why we have diagnostics, because one night does not insomnia make. So what exists out there? Well, there are actually four different ways to diagnose insomnia, different classification histories. And you can see that actually, it first entered as a diagnosis 
in 1975 by the World Health Organization in the, the darker blue. What you can see is over the years, it's been updated and reclassified. But the most important part of looking at the World Health Organization's classification of insomnia is that they have two main flavors. They suggest that there are two main flavors of insomnia, organic insomnia. And by that, what was generally meant was that the insomnia was secondary. It was secondary to a mental health condition, a physical health condition, or perhaps medication or substance. Conversely, you have non-organic insomnia. And this is where the insomnia exists on its own, in its own right. There is no other mental health, physical health, or substance that can be blamed for causing the insomnia. We'll see that the ICD-11 um, is currently uh, being put out there at the moment. So the new version of the International Classification of Diseases, that should be with us this year or next year. Now, what they've decided to do under the uh, ICD-11 is they're going to have just one term and it's going to be called chronic insomnia. All right, let's go to purple. Always unhappy with how the World Health Organization does something. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine then created their own diagnostic criteria. And again, gone through many different iterations over the years. And we finally have something now called the ICSD-3. So the third version of the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. Under that framework, we have a term called chronic insomnia disorder. In red, we've got the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. That started in 1980 in terms of having insomnia into the mix, and again, has also gone through many, many iterations. In 2013, they determined in that version, the DSM-5, that we would have something called insomnia disorder. Whoa, insomnia disorder. The reason I talk about those three collectively is because chronic insomnia under the ICD-11, chronic insomnia disorder under ICSD-3 and the DSM-5 are actually now all completely in alignment. In other words, they're all saying that you need to have the same circumstances and report the same things in order to have a diagnosis of insomnia. We'll move very briefly on to something else called the RDC. This was created in 2004 by Jack Edinger. And unlike previous iterations of all of the other classification systems, Jack felt that there was not just two flavors of insomnia, organic or non-organic, but actually there were many different flavors of insomnia. And he actually detailed these and they're called primary insomnia, which is very similar to what we would say is non-organic insomnia. Insomnia due to mental disorder. So the organics, he's actually detailed what kind of other disorders with it. Psychophysiological, which is a very, form of uh, conditioned arousal. People can't sleep because they're constantly thinking about sleep, and they're ruminating about their sleep. Paradoxical insomnia. This is somebody who reports a very, very, very nasty case of insomnia, but actually when we look at how they're sleeping, it doesn't appear to be quite the case. Idiopathic insomnia. Insomnia that has been there since childhood. And then we go back to some of our others, insomnia related to periodic limb movement disorder, a disorder of sleep where you have fidgeting in the legs, insomnia related to sleep apnea, where you stop breathing during the night, insomnia due to a medical condition or indeed a drug or substance. Now, the reason I talk about the RDC is because the three main types that we could talk about, the psychophysiological, the paradoxical, and the idiopathic, we still look at those today. So even though under any of the classification systems that we've got, we might say somebody has insomnia, but we might want to work out whether it's psychophysiological, paradoxical, 
or idiopathic because it might inform treatment. These are the three current nosologies that we work with at the moment, ICD-10, ICSD-3, and DSM-5. The one thing that you will notice is that they're all blue. Yes, that's not wonderful. They're all blue, how fabulous. But let's stick with the DSM-5. The reason I've chosen the DSM-5 is because they were the first people to introduce the idea of insomnia disorder. And what they've done here, and all the other nosologies have followed suit, is that they've rejected this idea that there is a distinction between non-organic and organic insomnia. In other words, what we're saying here is that if you have insomnia, if you meet the criteria for insomnia, it doesn't matter what other illnesses, substances, medications that you might have, it is still a disorder and should be treated in its own right. This is a remarkable thing to happen to us as a community of sleep scientists, because we've known for some time that insomnia is not a symptom. It is actually a disorder. So what do we need? All right. In order for us to diagnose somebody with insomnia disorder, we've got to have eight criteria met. Now, the first one, a principal complaint of dissatisfaction with sleep, quality or quantity, characterized either singularly or in combination by initial, middle or late insomnia. What does that mean? Initial insomnia, problems getting off to sleep. Middle insomnia, waking up in the night and not being able to go to sleep. Or late insomnia, waking up early in the morning, much earlier than you need to, and not being able to get back off to sleep again. Now, as you'll see from that particular one item, that's very, very sensitive, isn't it? It's gonna capture everyone with insomnia, but it's also gonna capture an awful lot of people who have got other sleep problems that are not insomnia. And so what we do from that is we become much more specific with our questions. There should be clinically significant distress or impairment to daily functioning. It should occur for at least three nights per week. That's an interesting one. And the reason we have that particular question is because even normal sleepers have one or two nights. And as I say, one night does not insomnia make. It should be present for at least three months. Unfortunately, this is where I disagree with the DSM-5. Uh, the work that I've done over the years is looking at what happens before that. What are the conditions that occur that make somebody get insomnia disorder? And we can pretty much say insomnia is insomnia after about two weeks. I'm certainly not gonna prevent myself from treating someone if they've had insomnia only for two months. Ah, <gasps> how awful. All right, it should occur despite adequate opportunity for sleep. If you're not giving yourself enough time to sleep, then the likelihood is yes, you're going to have a sleep problem. This is a nod back to our organic insomnia, but it's nicely framed at least. It should not be better explained by another sleep disorder. It should not be attributable to a medication or substance or adequately explained by a mental or medical condition. What that means to us is that if somebody has diabetes, you're not automatically going to say, well, the insomnia is because they have the diabetes. You can actually say the insomnia might even be causing or making the diabetes worse and should therefore be managed. The other thing that you might notice is that all of those questions uh, under the DSM-5 and similarly with the others, is that they're all about self-report. They're all about what the patient is reporting to you. Now that's interesting. Unlike a broken leg, you can certainly see or at least do an X-ray. We haven't been able to find a biological signature for insomnia. And that's a challenge. We've looked, we've looked at sleep, we've looked at how people uh, express their hormones and nothing really seems to come through. It seems quite a mixed bag. And so because we haven't got a biological signature for insomnia, there's no objective test of insomnia. That's why we're relying on people's self 
reports. We have three main symptom types. Now I talked about the three variants of insomnia, but actually within that, we've got our three symptom types. Remember that first question from the diagnosis, initial, middle, or late. This is a nice slide from uh, Dieter Riemann, who's at the University of Freiburg. And what we've got here is uh, actigraphy data. And this is data that is from a wristwatch device that specifically measures sleep. In the block itself, you've got, this is when somebody went to bed, and this is when somebody got out of bed. The black parts are the parts where somebody is actually sleeping, whereas the gray parts are where somebody is in bed, but awake. So if we look at the one on the left-hand side, what we've got here, is lots of gray at the beginning, and then lots of black. This is an initial or a sleep onset problem. What about the second one, the one in the middle? Well, it doesn't appear to be much problem getting off to sleep. They're going straight into the black, but we're seeing a bit of gray in the middle. So that's a middle or a problem staying asleep. What about the one on the right? This is a tricky one, isn't it? It's got some gray and then some black and then some gray and then some black and then some gray. This is what we call a mess. What we're saying here is that somebody can have more than one symptom type. You can have problems getting off to sleep and staying asleep and waking up too early in the morning. So again, I think this talks to why we don't have a biological signature. It seems to be an awful lot of flavors in the mix, doesn't it? What do they mean? So a quick clinical pearl, anyone who's actually talking to patients about insomnia, we tend to see about a quarter of people with insomnia will complain of difficulties getting off to sleep. Almost a third, it's going to be middle insomnia, problems staying asleep. And almost a quarter waking up too early in the morning, despite not needing to. When we are looking at these different types, one of the first things we might want to look at is what sort of issues are associated with those particular symptoms. Initial is very associated with anxiety. And so you might want to look at somebody's levels of anxiety if they've got a problem getting off to sleep. Middle tends to be quite medical or medication use. We'd certainly see that with a lot of pain medications they start wearing off in the middle of the night and the person's likely to wake up. Late, we often associate with depression. That's quite an interesting way to start looking at the different types and how they might interrelate with other diseases or disorders. So that's insomnia. That's generally what we have in terms of our diagnostic of insomnia. How much of it exists? Is it a problem? Because if it's not a problem, then we're spending an awful lot of time talking about it, aren't we? Well, believe it or not, when we started to look at insomnia, majority of the studies that have been done there, looking at how much of it actually exists out there, look at it from the chronic insomnia disorder. Remember the three months? Well, there's two studies, believe it or not, in the whole world that have looked at how much insomnia exists prior to three months the period we would call acute insomnia. Now, fortunately, I'm one of those people who looks at this particular area. And what we can see is that approximately 31 to 36% of the population will get acute insomnia over the period of a year. So a third of the population will get acute insomnia in a year. And if we took a snapshot of the general population, we're looking at about 8% of the population will have acute insomnia. Now think about it this way, that's, that's quite a big public health issue, isn't it? A third of the population are going to get acute insomnia in a year, about 8% of the population have acute insomnia at any given point, making it a very big public health issue. It's certainly one that I'm seeing a lot more at the moment because of COVID and because of all the the lockdowns that we're seeing around the world. What about chronic? The prevalence of chronic insomnia. Now, it's interesting because, as I said, all of these diagnostics have changed over the years. 
So we can look at it from the perspective of how do you ask the question? And as Maurice O'Hayan showed in 2002, how you ask the question will determine how much you see of it in the general population. So if you ask people about their insomnia complaints in terms of a chronic sphere, most people will say they have it. They've got a problem getting off to sleep, a problem staying asleep, or a problem waking up too early in the morning. Between 30 and 48% of the population will report insomnia complaints. If we ask that they tell us whether they've had it often or always, that reduces to 16 to 21%, What about moderate and severe, then it reduces between 10 and 28%. If we add the complaint with daytime consequences, nine to 15%, to satisfaction, eight to 18%. But if we finally get to the insomnia diagnosis, we're at about 6%. Now, when we're starting to look at DSM-5 criteria, that's actually a little bit higher. So we're talking about a prevalence worldwide of about 10 to 15% of the population. 10 to 15% of the population will be reporting a chronic form of insomnia. Wow. I mean, after you've figured out whether there's a high prevalence of something, you've got to also work out whether it's meaningful. You know, we might want to spend a lot of resources on, on trying to manage a disorder, but we really need to know that there are consequences associated with that disorder beforehand. Well, this is the list, the list. When we start to talk about these are all associated with insomnia. Now, some of them we can say that the insomnia comes first, but in most cases, we're talking that there's an association, and certainly there's an association between coronary heart disease and insomnia, prostate cancer and insomnia, osteoarthritis, breast cancer, hypertension, type two diabetes, obesity, hypertension. An interesting mix, isn't it? But we can also see that there are effects outside of those direct health consequences. If you have insomnia, you're more likely to smoke. You're certainly more likely to abuse alcohol. You're more likely to have marital dissatisfaction or partner dissatisfaction. You're more likely to go to work but be unproductive. You're more likely not to go to work at all. Believe it or not, you're more likely to take sexual risks, use illicit drugs, and get involved in accidents. Uh, we actually published a paper last year myself and colleagues in um, Quebec and Arizona. And what we showed was that insomnia was actually related to drink driving. If you have insomnia, you're more likely to drink drive. So it goes beyond just those direct health issues into some of those health behaviors that might essentially lead on to problems with your health. What else can we see? Suicide, post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, anxiety disorders, falls, hyperlipidemia, social isolation, and poorer academic performance. That really does speak to what Gail Green was talking about, doesn't it? When she was talking about it invading every part of her life, we can certainly see the data is showing that. Its consequences go are far reaching on physical, emotional, and psychological levels. However, there's one very interesting area where we can actually now say that insomnia causes a particular illness. And that happens to be major depression. Some beautiful work by Chiara Baglioni demonstrated that if you have insomnia and you don't have depression, you are twice as likely to develop depression in the future. Similarly, from our studies in 2014, what we demonstrated that even your first episode of insomnia, and even though it's still in its acute phase, in other words, between uh, two weeks and three months, that also sets you up for your first episode of depression. How? 
how is this actually happening? Well, this was a study that we did in my lab a few years ago. We took normal, healthy adults who were suffering from their first ever episode of insomnia, and it was still in their acute phase. They had no previous history of insomnia, anxiety, depression, nothing bad in there. We studied these people overnight. We wanted to look at exactly what was happening with their sleep. And what we could see is that there were two main differences between those people who were normal sleepers, those people who got better from their insomnia against those people who went on to develop chronic insomnia. And those two differences really were how quickly you went into your first rapid eye movement cycle and how much deep sleep or slow wave sleep you were getting at night. If you can see on the left, we've got REM latency, so how quickly you're going into REM. Normal sleepers, yeah, somewhere between 90 to 100 minutes, sounds perfectly normal to me. Those people who in the future, from their first episode of insomnia, they go and they just, they get better. They naturally remit. Yep, they're within that 90 to 100 minutes, so that we would see is normal. What are those people that in the future are going to develop chronic insomnia? On average, it's taking them 66 minutes to get into REM. Mm, that's a big difference, isn't it? 66 minutes to 90. When we look at how much slow wave sleep they're getting, also we're seeing that they're getting very small amounts of slow wave sleep, certainly compared to those people who are normal sleepers, and those people who are naturally going to get better. When I first saw this diagram, and thankfully I did create it, so I did see it first. What's the first thing I said to myself? Are these people going to become depressed? Now, why would I say that? Why would I say something silly like that? Because we've known since the 1970s that if you go into REM very quickly and in combination with a low level of deep, slow wave sleep, you're likely to express depression within the next four weeks. We've known that since the 70s. And so immediately what we're saying here is that transition from your first ever episode of insomnia not only sets you up to develop chronic insomnia, but it also sets you up, causes your first onset of depression. And certainly when we followed these people up, we found that the amount of them that went into depression was significant compared to our normal sleepers or those people who got better when we followed those people up. So in essence, we've talked about the diagnosis of insomnia. So we've got a diagnosis now, which is really helpful in terms of not excluding people for illnesses or medications. We've shown that a lot of people suffer from insomnia, making it a significant public health concern. And we've shown that there are consequences to it. And certainly it's causally related, it's risk factor for, uh, <laughs> for the development of depression. Okay, so that leads us somewhere else. This is a big issue, big consequences. Now we need to know how to fix it. How are we going to manage insomnia? One of the ways to do that is we look at how it develops. And believe it or not, and again, another area which is very limited in terms of research is how does insomnia actually occur? What happens for somebody to develop insomnia? And so we'll go back to 1987, lovely, lovely model. And this is a model by Art Spielman. It's called the 3P model. And really it's a nice, stress diathesis model of how insomnia develops. So if we look here, we've got our, on the left-hand side, insomnia intensity, and we've got a dotted line, which is our threshold. And what that means is, is that when you go over that threshold, that's when you meet criteria for insomnia. Okay, wonderful. All right, so what gets us to that threshold? Well, Spielman suggests that insomnia is made up of three parts. 
the three Ps, essentially. Predisposing factors, and these are the ones in green. You can see those in green. In essence, if you look at the diagram, they're not enough to give you insomnia. They don't get you over that threshold, do they? But they change your relationship. They make you more vulnerable to getting insomnia. So what are these predisposing factors we talk about? They could be biological traits, psychological traits, or even social factors. What do we know about the predisposition to insomnia? Being female, being older, having a health condition, physical or psychological, high levels of neuroticism, being a perfectionist, these are all associated with increased vulnerability for insomnia. So if you have those traits or those circumstances, you're more vulnerable to getting insomnia. So that green will be higher, almost potentially close to that threshold. But according to Spielman, they're not enough to give you insomnia. You have to have a precipitating event or a precipitating factor, something that triggers the actual insomnia itself. As you can see from the diagram, that precipitating factor has pushed the individual way up over the threshold of insomnia. Spielman suggests it could be a medical illness or a psychiatric illness or a stressful life event. And he certainly suggested that it would more likely be a stressful life event, something that pushes you over insomnia. In other words, by creating a flight or fight situation. What that also suggests is that this period, this onset of insomnia is actually adaptive. Think about it this way. How many of you have watched horror movies? I'm, I'm a real, real fan of horror movies. And my favorite are the 1980s slasher movies. Why on earth is he talking about this, you ask? Well, think about it this way. There's a usual stereotype in these movies. Last half an hour, there's usually uh, a young, blonde, white, very well endowed woman running away from a man with an ax, a knife, or a gun through an abandoned hospital or factory or some other abandoned building. Okay, in the middle of the night. Now, why does she not stop in any single movie? Why does she not stop at 11.30 and go, you know what, it's time for bed. I need to go to bed. We'll, we'll start again in the morning. So why can she keep running all night? How does she have this amazing strength when she finally battles the villain? It's because she's in a flight or fight response. And she doesn't need the sleep. That's something that is cordoned off. You don't need to sleep if you're running away from an ax man. I can guarantee you that. And so this is what Spielman's saying. This is what the stress diathesis is doing. You've given those resources to reduce the amount of sleep that you get so you can manage the precipitating event. That's what makes it adaptive. Then we have this area that Spielman calls short-term insomnia. As you can see, the predisposing factors are still not enough to get you over that threshold of insomnia. The insomnia is still being maintained largely by this stressful life event. But as you can see, between onset and short term, it's lessening. And that's an interesting point, isn't it? Even though the stressful life event may continue over months, years, a bereavement, a divorce, a loss of a job, that may, the stress of that may continue over a very long period of time. But if we think about it on a biological level, you can't maintain those biological hormones that keep the flight or fight response going for too long, you'll burn out. And so even though the emphasis or the impact of that stressful life event may still be there, the biological response, the adaptive response reduces. And that's what Spielman's talking about here in terms of that reduction 
in those precipitating factors. We also see a little bit of blue coming into the diagram here. This is what Spielman calls perpetuating factors. How have we describe perpetuating factors? In essence, these are the behavioral responses that we have in order to compensate for not sleeping very, very well. So we might spend excessive time in bed. If you want more sleep, where's the best place to hang out and wait for the Sandman? In bed. The problem with that is that if you decide to go to bed early or you have a lie in, it stretches out your sleep. And what that does is it makes it very light and very unrefreshing. So the quality of it actually deteriorates somewhat. He also suggested napping. If we nap in the daytime, we use up all of our credit, our sleep credit, which we build up throughout the day. And so when you get to bed at night, ah, you've got no credit left in order to pay the Sandman to sleep. Conditioning. And this was an interesting idea. It came from Dick Bootsin originally. And Dick suggested that what tends to happen is that when you don't sleep very well, but because you're spending extra time in bed waiting for the Sandman to come to you, you start engaging in what he calls stimulus discontrol. In other words, we start introducing daytime behaviors into a nighttime environment. Today, we call it nesting behavior. So what do we mean by nesting behavior? Typical patient, you know what? I'm gonna to go to bed early because I'm gonna wait for the Sandman to come. But I know I'm not gonna sleep. So, you know what, I'll take a book to read. Yep, I can read a book, okay. Actually, I'll take a magazine as well in case I get bored with this book or I don't wanna to get too engrossed in this book. Okay, so I've got my book, my magazine. You know what, I get thirsty at night. I'll take something to drink. I'll have something to drink. Well, I might as well take a snack if I've got something to drink as well. Uh, also, yeah, well, if I still can't sleep after that, I might as well try and catch up on work, make sure I'm ahead of myself so that I don't uh, worry too much about it. So I'll take my laptop. Well, if I take my laptop, I might as well have my phone in there so I can use my five lives of Candy Crush whilst I'm catching up on my email. Suddenly, you've got a bedroom full of environmental and behavioral factors which are associated with the daytime. You've blurred the lines between the bedroom being a space to sleep in. So this is what we talk about in terms of conditioning. The other thing that we do, as we would say by Spielman, in terms of perpetuating, is we start to use substances. So I'll drink coffee to keep me awake. I'll drink alcohol to put me to sleep. All of these things, the excessive time in bed, the napping, the conditioning, the substances, all are detrimental to sleep. And as we can see, when insomnia has become chronic, according to Spielman, it's not the predisposing factors that keep the insomnia alive. It's not those precipitating factors, the biological precipitant has become negligible because the organism needs to survive. In essence, what Spielman is saying is that insomnia becomes chronic because of these behaviors that we start to engage in. Beautiful theory. In 1993, we started to look beyond just behavior. And this was largely put forward by Charles Morin in 1993, his model of insomnia. And as we can see, we've got insomnia in the middle here, and we've got those maladaptive habits on the right-hand side, excessive time in bed, an irregular sleep schedule, daytime napping, will also include those substances and the conditioning. These lead on to consequences, the ones that we can see that are associated with our insomnia, certainly from a diagnostic point of view, there's mood disturbances, there's fatigue, social discomfort, and problems with our daily performance. This all leads us to be quite aroused at night. And that arousal is not only thinking a lot, that cognitive arousal, but it might also be physiologic. I'm very tense in bed. 
but also I get very upset. And those ruminations that I'm having lead me to a very, very dark space. And then finally, some of those thoughts and feelings bleed into the insomnia itself. Moran was the first person to suggest, well, actually, you know, it's not just about those behaviors. It's not just those behaviors that keep insomnia alive. It's also how we think about it, how we think about insomnia and how we think about the consequences of insomnia. Worry over lost sleep, rumination over how I'm not gonna manage tomorrow having unrealistic expectations of our sleep. I should be sleeping like a teenager. No, you're never gonna sleep like a teenager once you're outside of teenager. Yes. Misattribution or amplification. The reason I didn't get that promotion was because of my insomnia. What Morin is saying here is that it goes beyond just behavior into cognition. So. Cognition and behavior are the things that fuel insomnia and they keep the insomnia going. Now, there are a myriad, and I mean a myriad of models out there looking at insomnia. I've chosen those two because Spielman was the first and then Morin really added in that cognitive element. But there's one thing that really, we, when we're talking about the models of insomnia, what we can see is that they all actually share quite a lot of common traits. And they all follow largely Spielman's original model, but they just added a little bit more sensitivity or specificity around the elements of that particular model. They all talk about a pre-morbid vulnerability. In other words, that predisposing factor that Spielman talked about. Being female, being older, physical health problem, mental health problem, neuroticism, perfectionism. Okay. However, what is the single biggest predisposing factor? Having insomnia in the past. You have insomnia in the past, or have had insomnia in the past, it is a significant predictor that you're going to get it again. All right, so beyond that predisposing factor, what else is in there? All of the models now talk about physiologic hyper arousal. In other words, you're in bed, you are tense, you are physically aroused, and that is stopping you from going off to sleep. Cognitive hyper arousal. I can't stop thinking. My mind will not calm down. I have all these intrusive thoughts. I worry, I wake up in the middle of the night and I worry about the most unusual things. Cortical hyperarousal. Now this is an interesting one. First introduced by Michael Perlis in 1997. And Michael said that actually, one of the things that we fundamentally know about sleep may not actually be happening right in patients with insomnia. One of the things that we know is that during the night, during sleep, parts of the brain tend to shut down or at least go into a default mode, mainly in the frontal lobe. Those parts of the brain, irrespective of whether you're awake or not, are down-regulated during the night, okay? It's much more controlled by our body clock than our drive to sleep. And so because we might be awake with our insomnia in the night, but parts of our brain are not working quite efficiently during the night, this might lead us to having lots of un unkind and unworrisome thoughts. And he called it a, a cortical type of arousal in that you are awake but parts of your brain are switched down. They all also talk about something called the conditioned response. Remember we're talking about conditioned, um, conditioning in the bedroom. So this is a conditioned response to the bedroom or the bedroom routine. One of the things that I always ask patients is, you know, what do you think about your bedroom? What, what, what's your relationship 
with like your bed, with your bed. And, you know, people with insomnia talk about a bed of glass, a bed of nails, a bed of thistles. They have a very combative relationship with their bedroom. And that is a very good sign that they're conditioned to be aroused at night and in the bedroom itself. It's very common for a patient with insomnia to fall asleep on the sofa in the early part of the night, wake up a few minutes later, think, oh, you know what? I'm ready for bed. I've had the signs. I am ready for bed. I fell asleep. Fantastic. They make their way slowly up the stairs to go to bed. As soon as they enter the bedroom, it's like somebody turns on a switch. Suddenly they are fully awake and starting to engage in physiologic, cognitive and cortical hyper arousal. That's a conditioned response. So all of the models that we have got really do focus on those particular issues. Have this been tested? Has this actually been tested? It's a good question. Has Spielman's model actually been tested? The answer is yes, but only in 2021. Michael Perilous produced a paper looking at sleep extension. Do people really sleep extend during uh, this acute phase of insomnia? And I've produced a paper in 2021 looking at some of those pre-morbid characteristics and coping characteristics. And it largely suggests that Spielman might be correct, except for the timing might be wrong. Hence going back to insomnia, being insomnia after about two weeks. But all of the models really do focus in on two overarching factors, dysfunctional thought and sleep incompatible behavior. That suggests to us a beautiful way to treat insomnia. Managing dysfunctional cognitions and helping someone manage those sleep incompatible behaviors. In other words, a cognitive behavioral framework sounds like it is the optimal way to try to treat insomnia. So how do we treat insomnia? Yes, believe it or not, we have something called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, CBTI. Now, there have been thousands of studies uh, on Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. What do we know from those studies? We know it's just as effective as medication. It's longer lasting than medication. We know approximately 80% of people who do CBTI get better. We know it also reduces anxiety and depression by about 50%. It increases your cognitive awareness, decreases your pain thresholds, increases your ability to think more clearly and reduces suicide ideation. So it, it goes beyond the sleep itself and the impact can be seen across quite a lot of different areas. So what is this amazing CBTI? Generally, after collecting sleep history, a medical history and a psychiatric history, we would engage in six one-hourly sessions if we're doing it face-to-face. -face. We do sleep education, pretty much some of the things that I've talked about this morning, uh, this afternoon to you. Then we talk about sleep hygiene, all of those behavioral factors that can influence our sleep and how the environment can influence our sleep so people can start to manage the hygiene around the bedroom and their lifestyle. And then we start something called sleep restriction. We don't restrict how much sleep somebody gets. It's a horrible misnomer. What we're actually doing in this instance is we're reducing the amount of time they spend in bed. In week three, we do stimulus control. We get everything out of the bedroom that's daytime related, and we get someone not to spend extra time in bed. And then we start managing the mind by keeping a, a daily diary. In week four, we manage effort. We stop people trying to sleep, and we manage any of those intrusive thoughts in the night. Week five, you'll manage all of those intrusive and misattributions during the day. And then in the week, the final week, you'll have a review. 
possibly we might want to add some mindfulness or some relaxation techniques. But generally, I do it as a relapse prevention. The main part of CBTI, however, is from a sleep diary. Somebody's reports about their sleep so that we can tailor it to an individual. It all sounds pretty much like a package, doesn't it? But we actually tailor the elements of sleep restriction using our sleep diaries. We know it's effective. The challenge is there's not many people out there who deliver CBTI or train people in CBTI. So that's what we really need to be working on next. Okay, well, that's it for me. Does anyone have any questions? Is there anything in chat? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ellis. It's absolutely a great talk. I mean, it's one of the, um, the talks that I've been really looking forward to and it completely exceeded my expectations. So thank <laughs> you so much for, for speaking to us. Um, I, I get to, uh, since I'm doing the Q&A, I get to steal the, the first question. Um, and I'm, and I pretend to, to say that uh, this is while the other people are, are typing up their questions. Um, so my question would be, since just to follow up from, from the treatment part, um, there are currently a lot of, I believe, uh, apps <clears throat> on the phone that uh, provides some sort of um, CBTI. I I'm personally not really familiar with them, so I was wondering uh, if you could provide some opinion about mm. um, those apps. Yeah, so we've got three in the United Kingdom alone, and there's, there's plenty all over the world, actually. Um, in essence, they're delivering CBTI or a variant of CBTI via an app. Um, I think my personal opinion about them is that I think they're great in terms of dissemination because you know, there aren't a lot of therapists who do it. I know certainly in the United Kingdom, it's very challenging for people to get to see someone like me because uh, I'm very elusive. So I think in, in terms of dissemination and implementation, I think they're brilliant. Whether they should replace a therapist, that's where I, I question it. And I think that as long as the person A does have insomnia, B doesn't have a too complicated insomnia, and three, that they fill out everything correctly and do and follow the guidelines correctly, I think they're fine. Um, I have a problem when you start to look at more complex cases. And I think that's when you need somebody face to face. Wonderful, thank you. I, I think there's a natural question that was also um, uh, asked in the Q&A section, which is uh -huh. uh, basically can CBTI used to treat uh, patients with, uh, with both uh, insomnia and uh, depression? Right, and, and this is a really interesting one. Um, and it actually led the New York Times to actually put out an article saying stop treating depression and start treating insomnia. What mm. we know is when we have people with both conditions and we give them CBTI, we manage both the insomnia and the depression. However, if we give them CBT for depression, we manage the depression, but not the insomnia. So actually in a lot of instances, and certainly I, when I've done a lot of training, um, I've incorporated it into existing services for people with anxiety and depression, because if you can manage their sleep, people with depression and anxiety get a really serious reduction in symptoms. Cool, 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 wonderful. And I think there's another question about uh, CBTI. <laughs> um, I'll do a separate lecture on CBTI if you like. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean... I, I think that will be very, very um, interesting as well. So uh, the person asks um, about the statistic that, that I think you mentioned, which is 80% uh, uh, people get better with CBTI, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, so he was wondering if there was any characteristics of those people. Is it, are those severe patients? And... Um, are there any other characteristics that makes people 
respond well to CBTI and also uh, reversely if there's anything that makes people not uh, respond to CBTI? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's it's something I think that our, the sleep community has not been as mindful of as they should have been in terms of trying to work out who doesn't get better. Um, there are a few studies which have picked up characteristics. Jason Ong's done some work, Rachel Mamber and um, Julio Fernandez Mendoza. And what they found is that people who have a very short sleep duration, as well as insomnia, are less likely to get better. Um, there's another study that suggests that people with very, very severe insomnia don't always manage as well. Um, and there's another study which suggests that if you've had insomnia as a child, it's very hard to treat it in adulthood, that idiopathic insomnia that we were talking about. Um, the other thing is, is, and again, I think this is a, a detriment to our community, is that paradoxical insomnia, and this is where somebody reports very bad insomnia symptoms, but if we actually looked at their sleep, they don't sleep terribly badly at all. In my view, they're not candidates for CBTI. They shouldn't be getting CBTI. We should find a different treatment for those people. But in many of the research studies and in many clinical practices, people don't differentiate whether somebody's got paradoxical insomnia and therefore will include them in there. And I, my, my suspicion is they're gonna take up some of that proportion of people who don't get better because essentially you're giving the wrong treatment for the right disorder. Cool, 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 wonderful. If we can go to um, uh, a slightly different type of question, which is um, which is from Charlie, who uh, knows about um, some research done by uh, uh, Surrey, um, by by the University of Surrey, with uh, regarding biomarkers associated mm. with sleep and sleep deprivation. And um, he was wondering if he could provide your your insights, uh, your insights into um, biomarkers related to insomnia. You, you mentioned that They're it was that. really hard. Yeah, and, and this is something that we've got to be very mindful of. Um, and, and Surrey, you know, the group at Surrey, which is a phenomenal group, um, they don't work in insomnia. They work in sleep and sleep deprivation and sleep deprivation and insomnia are not the same beasts. That's the thing. A lot of people make an assumption that lost sleep is a major characteristic of insomnia. Um, and they have some overlaps, but depriving somebody of sleep or reducing the amount of sleep that they get is not quite the same thing as waking up for half an hour in the middle of the night and then or or having a problem getting off to sleep for an hour and a half because there's this extra rumination the worry and that's one of the reasons why we can find genetic and biological signatures for how well somebody tolerates sleep deprivation but we can't find a marker of insomnia and i think because because insomnia is so many things, idiopathic, paradoxical, psychophysiological, onset, maintenance, uh, early morning awakenings. There's so many flavors of it. Um, it's, it's always gonna be challenging. The group at Freiburg, um, Dieter Riemann's group, have been looking and they've been looking for a very long time. One of the conclusions that they've came to was that there might be something wrong with REM uh, in that, when somebody's in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, it might become fragmented. And that may be, there was more fragmentation in patients with insomnia compared to those patients who were normal sleepers, you know, matched normal sleepers. Challenge is with that is, did they get that increased fragmentation because they had insomnia? Or is it actually a biological marker for insomnia? This is where we need many more natural history studies in order to look at the evolution of insomnia to be able to say, well, you know, if we found this person who has this REM instability, as it was called, are uh, they're more likely to get insomnia. At the moment, we can only conclude that there's an association between REM instability and insomnia. 
So a lot more work needs to be done there. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I am a bit, uh, to be honest, I'm, I, it's the first time, but I'm a bit overwhelmed with <laughs> all of the questions that just has been uh, flowing in. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think there's another general um, trend uh, in the questions, which is basically uh, whether you can um, treat different types of sleep-related issues uh, or whether they, can, they, they should be treated um, uh, together, like, for example, uh, insomnia in, as well as sleep apnea, narcolepsy, and, and things uh, like that. Yeah, it, again, a nice question. Um, and we know there's an overlap of about 50% with apnea and insomnia, for example. Um, <clears throat> and the question always comes is, what do we treat first? Do we treat the apnea? Do we treat the insomnia? There's some beautiful work that's been done in, um, by the group in Iceland. Uh, and what they did is they got a load of patients with um, both insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea. Based upon the symptom profile for insomnia, determined whether they should manage the insomnia first with CBTI and then the apnea with CPAP or the other way around. And what they found was if the individual's insomnia was a problem getting off to sleep, treat the insomnia before you treat the apnea. If the problem's one that people wake up during the night, so that middle insomnia, do the CPAP first and then the CBTI. And when they did it that way in one of their follow-on trials, and I know this has been replicated in Australia as well, when they did that and tailored the treatments based upon the symptoms, they actually saw incredible amounts of success, both in terms of the insomnia, the apnea, and compliance. And this is one of the big issues around the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea is compliance to CPAP. If you manage the onset insomnia, then people get off to sleep with their CPAPs. And that was the important key point there. If you've got somebody who put on a mask and they've got a problem getting off to sleep because of insomnia, they're not gonna like the mask because they're gonna stay awake. So if you treated that insomnia, then you get them to be much more compliant with their CPAP. Cool, 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 wonderful. Um, if, if that's okay, there are still a lot of questions that are unanswered, uh, but we've already reached um, more than the hour. So I was hoping that um, if anyone have uh, uh, with those questions, we could, um, you could direct them to the International Sleep Charity contact form and we can just compile everything together and then uh, ask um, Professor Ellis's advice because uh, uh, I, I don't want to take too much of, of his time. <laughs> If that's okay, all right. Yeah, so sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah. If if that's okay, we will uh, um, stop now, and then um, we will try to answer your questions. If you can, could please direct them to our website, internationalsleepcharity.org. So again, thank you so much, Professor Ellis, for an absolutely great talk, and I guess uh, see you soon. Thanks very much. Have a great okay. afternoon or morning, wherever you happen to be. Wonderful. Thank you so much.